It is morning. Sunday morning. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Zocalo. We are talking all things Babylon 5. And today we're spotlighting on John J. Sheridan. And we're going to talk about our favorite moments. And I don't know about you, Norm, but I have been psyched about this all week because I've been compiling my list. This is a tough list. This is a tough list. A tough list. Why well, a tough actually, list? Well, because there are, except with the exception of season one, obviously. Yeah. There are so many different phases to John Sheridan in four seasons. It's very true. And I don't know how you organized your list, but I ended up like kind of categorizing my moments as like speechy Sheridan, angry Sheridan, happy Sheridan, and then mm -hmm. compiling a list through those categories. Oh, absolutely. That's what I did. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, most of, most of my list was speechy Sheridan, but... There are like small moments that I wanted to to bring up and, and put on my list, but Oh yeah, me too. I just if I did that, then we'd just talk about all four seasons of them. <laughs> right? I mean it's Well, yeah, I I feel like today's probably gonna be this massive free for all between our input as we discuss things and then as our listeners and viewers uh kind of chime in with their moments. I mean, anything goes, anything that you consider a uh, a fun or a good John J. Sheridan moment, we're going to try and cram it into this hour. Oh, totally. And, yeah. yeah. And it's, we, I mean, we have our lists. I'm sure our listeners have their lists. And then, oh, no doubt. Yeah. This, I think that the bottom line is that there's a lot of great stuff to be said about John J. Sheridan. That is why he's our hero. Yeah. Yep. Yes. So, can I embarrass you for a second on, on the air? I guess so. Have at it. So something happened significantly yesterday, yeah? Um, I mean, or maybe there's like, I don't know, the whole moon landing anniversary. There was all the Star Trek news that came out of San Diego Comic Con. Holy crap. I'm still absorbing that, by the way. Wow. None of that stuff matters. What matters, <laughs> what matters is that you celebrated a milestone. Oh, I did, did I? Yeah. What milestone is this? Your birthday? <laughs> yeah, my 38th, it's not really a milestone. Every year, this is, I told Carol this once, I said, my favorite holiday of the year is my birthday. Mm. And the logic is, it's not because, you know, I'm an egomaniac or anything like that. It's just that if we don't celebrate a birthday, we don't get to celebrate everything else. Oh, that's interesting logic. It's true, though. How, how Jakar point. is that? <laughs> that is some Jakar stuff. Right. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I've always, I've been a fan of, you know, I, I don't know. I don't get to make a big deal out of my birthday, but I mean, yeah, it's fun. I, I prefer it even over Christmas because mm. I'm not a religious person. It doesn't have the same kind of significance. And especially since we're fairly far removed from family and we don't travel over the holidays, it's just too much of a pain in the ass. Um, you know, it's quiet and it's good, but you know, yeah. I don't know. I prefer kind of like the more minor holidays, like St. Patrick's Day. Let's have a beer and have a good time. That's sort of a thing. I prefer that. But I prefer, birthdays are good too. Yeah, I love celebrating people's birthdays because if I don't get to do that, then I didn't. Uh, then I never would have had a chance to have met them at all. Truth. Yeah. You know? If they were not here, you you'd be none the wiser. Exactly. And then we wouldn't be here. Right. And we are, though. And mm -hmm. we have John Bauer socks here. So hello. And he's a year older than me. All right. Cool. I'm a semi spring chicken. Yeah. You're such youngins. <laughs> you guys are youngins. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a old, I'm an old man. No, you're not. I am. I'll no, be turning, you're really not. I'll be turning 48 in March of next year. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, really, 48, 38. What's a number, right? <laughs> it really is like mentally, where do you feel you fall in terms of your 12. age? 12. 12? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like I mentally, I'm anywhere from about, oh, I don't know, 12 to maybe 25 at best. I'm 12 Physically, it's anywhere from 21 to 85. I'm 12 because I have like action figures still. Yeah. In, in, in my pantheon back there. Uh, see, my action figures are hiding out in the closet doing who knows what but uh johnny's in there probably with delenn making out well hey now hey now 
Yeah, I mean, that's their business. I'm not going to get involved. This is a PG show, a plastic G show. Oh, <laughs> sure it is. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I, like, I don't know where to the go. The awkward with that. silence says yeah, it I was all. Like, I was like, <laughs> probably right. So, seeing as how we are broadcasting now at ten o'clock in the morning, the Bravari. I know it's five o'clock in some time zone far away from us. What are you drinking this morning? Oh, I'm drinking coffee for the horde. Nice, nice coffee. Yep, mm. coffee for the horde. Shall uh, we valtu to that? We should. Yes, Val- valtu. Valtu. What kind of coffee do you drink? I have a espresso machine oh, in the kitchen, so I make myself a latte with Irish cream, not the Bailey's Irish cream. Although I've considered that for this show. So you're a um, you're a coffee you're a co- you're a barista, weren't oh, you? Many oh, years, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. You told me that. Yeah, yeah. I ordered from then. I ordered from you then. And like, hey, Shar, what's up? Yo. Hey, Norm. Normal? Yeah, normal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Normal. Oh yeah. man, that that's the fun of that kind of a job too. Is you get to know those regulars, and if you make their coffee right, they usually reward you handsomely. It's a happy day when you get like your coffee just right in the morning. You know, oh. it's like one less thing to worry about. Mm, yeah, it's a blissful feeling. Yes, I mean, as a barista, you can make or break somebody's day with that. <laughs> this is true. It's a lot of responsibility. <laughs> well, Shar, what do you Shall think? Shall we? Can we jump we into have- it. We have so many things to talk about. So why don't we dive in? Okay. So how do you want to do this? So, so you came up to me with this idea, like right after uh, we did our see it or skip it. And I think, why did you come up with the our favorite moments of John Sheridan from that episode? Because our, one of our our new format thing, and, and we've settled into it, I think, really nicely, is that from one episode, we kind of find the the inspiration, the impetus to do the next episode. So why John Sheridan after See It or Skip It season two? Well, I think the big thing was that season two is our introduction to John Sheridan. And so it was pretty easy to make that leap. And I thought, oh, that would be such a fun topic. Let's do that. Initially, I thought, oh, maybe we ought to do like our spotlight, the deep dive focus Mm -hmm. on Sheridan. I thought, no, I kind of want to do something a little lighthearted. And so then it just kind of, you know, the gears turned a little bit uh, as much as they can anymore with my last two remaining brain cells. And then I said, Hey, Norm, what do you think about this idea? And you said, yeah. And I said, cool. And then here we are. (laughs) That's the science of it, folks. Really technical. It's really, yeah. It's so complex. It really is. See (laughs) what it's funny. It's kind of like when, when you do a live stream like this and, and instead of a podcast, you're kind of like seeing, you're letting people see how the sausage is made in a way. It's true because we really can't edit ourselves on this. No, nope. we, we, we can't go back and slash it. And we're not going to give you some refined after the fact version. Nope. Nope. This is live this is unscripted. What will be will be. You just have to let that go. This is Babylon 5 raw. It is <laughs> raw and unfiltered. Raw. So I like okay. I like John Bower Sox's comment here. He said that understanding is a three edged sword, your side, their side and the truth. Wasn't that Mark Twain who said that? I think Jakar said that. Well, maybe that too. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's a very good quote. Yes, it's it's true. It's so true. So okay, so let's um let's dive into our favorite moments of John Sheridan. Now you have your favorite moments. I have my favorite moments. I'm sure the listeners have their favorite moments. And we haven't compared our lists. So no, we don't know what the other person's gonna say. Yeah. And just um, for the record. Oh, um, my oh. buddy Randy said it was Kosh. Oh, yeah. He did say understanding is a three-edged sword. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Good, good for you, dude. Good for you. Yeah, I'm glad you're hot or like more high, higher functioning in the morning than I am. Yeah. Uh, Even with coffee, it's going to take a little more, you know, birthday celebrations and whatnot. Ugh. We'll get yeah. there. Getting older it takes a little longer to filter all that out. We'll definitely get there. So uh, I haven't put mine. I have one. Uh, of my of my favorite moments as the top favorite moment of Sheridan of all time, and I think it's one of the Ooh. top moments of Babylon Five of all time. Okay. But I haven't I haven't really weighed my moments like as as significantly, f- except for that top top pick. Okay, you Did know you- what? I don't know if I have a top top pick, and mine are in no particular order either. Okay. Um, if you want, I will start off with the very first thing that came to my mind when I was compiling my list. 
Go for it. Let's do it. Okay. So John J. Sheridan, we were just uh, off of a season two kind of a thing. And so the first thing I thought of with John J. Sheridan was when he mentions to his sister, who's visiting the station in Revelations, that he ate fresh oranges for the first time in years because you can't get them in deep space. And this sparks this whole trend, right, of seeing a bowl of oranges in his quarters. And especially when Janet Greek directs, Janet Greek. she makes that point to show the oranges. And I'm like, that's John Sheridan. So yep. it's a very small moment, but it's very significant to him. Yeah, it's it's interesting how the directors, uh, they start kind of like dropping in little hints of their own personalities, what they want to see in their episodes. Like Mike Vehar always kind of like shooting through some type of foreground lighting mechanic or detail. Uh-huh. He did that all the way back when he was you know directing TV back in the 80s, because I always remember watching the an episode of Magnum PI and it's like Mike Vehar is directing and I go, I wonder if he's going to shoot through anything like Christmas light and lo and behold, he did <laughs> just his style. Yep. So we should find out if, um, if Janet did any other work and if she dropped anything like that into her, into her episodes that are like, yeah, like antithetical to the entire story. Just like, Oh, I'm just going to throw in a, like a, an orange bowl somewhere. You know? <laughs> or was this reserved just for John Sheridan? Yeah. So you really liked the whole dynamic of the orange, the orange blossom, like when when Alaric yeah. gave him the orange blossom is the you know the techno mage. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, okay. just this weird, like it kind of a not really a random theme, but a very specific thing. Does for it him. does it humanize him more early? I don't know. Maybe maybe all that I really care about. I mean. Oranges are probably my favorite fruit. And so oh. if they're John's as well, well, hey, we got something in common. There you go. There <laughs> and you I go. think that might have been all it was way back when. But then the fact that Janet Greek made such a point to emphasize it, it's just it's kind of endearing to me. My picks are so serious. Yours was fun. Mine's serious. Oh, I've got serious ones too. Oh, Don't okay. you worry. It's a okay. mix. It's a grab okay. bag. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, so what's your uh, first one? So I'm I'm gonna make I guess I'm going to make a confession here. All of my picks, okay. and it's really unfair because I think there are way more, like even more fun scenes than what I've picked or better scenes. But all of my picks come from either season three or season four. That's pretty. I mean, there, there's some intense things happening in those seasons. It makes some sense. Yeah, I was picking intense stuff. So my first pick, and I think it's one of my favorite scenes like of all time, not just a Sheridan scene, but it's okay. when it's when. This is kind of like I'm I'm a big fan of characters who are forced to make the hard play, the hard call. You know, they, yeah. This is why leaders become leaders because no one else wants to make that call, especially in a in front of a group of people. Yeah. So okay. that's why you have your Captain Picards, your Captain Kirks, you know, your Captain Cisco's, your cap, you know, Captain this, Captain that. Well, in this case, the episode The Long Night is an episode where where John Sheridan asks the Ranger, Erickson. Yes, played by Brian Cranston. Mm -hmm. He asks him to make basically the ultimate sacrifice of you have to sell that you're protecting this data crystal with your lives and make it real. And there was a point where you had that awkward silence where he says he asks that of Erickson and Erickson's like, I understand. And, you know, Sheridan, the one piece of detail in the writing that I love, he's like, you're not a married man, are you, Erickson? Because he's concerned about the legacy, his family. And exactly. Yeah. Does he have a family that's going to miss him if right. he makes his sacrifice? Right. And there's just everyone in that war room, in 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 the Babylon Five war room, like all the non-aligned world races are there watching him ask Erickson to make this play. And that's just like, how does a leader do that? How do you get to that point? You know. Yeah, that is some tough stuff to stomach. Yeah. But as you said earlier, that is the stuff that true leaders are made of. They know what's at stake. They know the cost. Mm -hmm. And they have to make those really tough decisions. I mean, he doesn't want to send this guy to his death. No. But does the end justify the means? Unfortunately, yeah, because it worked. Well, it goes back to one of my favorite scenes in science fiction, and that's when that's when Captain Christopher Pike, this is all the way back in the cage, the original series. Mm, the cage. Yes. And he's sitting down with Dr. Boyce and he's like, you know, I'm, yeah, he goes, you bet I'm tired. I'm tired of, you know. I love that scene. Yeah. Because it's a very human scene. For, it really 
is. He's happening. so vulnerable. Exactly. And it's like, I, I don't want to make the hard play anymore. And that's kind of like what, where Chris Pine was with Bones in Star Trek Beyond. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm tired of making the the hard calls. You know, it's like, when, when do I get to have any fun? You know, when do, when do right. I get to like, you know, let up on the gas and not be responsible for X amount of lives who lives and who dies? Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Big, important theme, I think, for every starship captain. They all kind of have that moment. Yeah. Because it's it's got to wear you down. It's hard to not just keep that in your brain as you go on. I mean, as a human being, you can only be, you can only have so much disconnect. You can only be so emotionally mm -hmm. detached unless you've, you're you like a sociopath or something. Right. But uh, a functioning human being is going to carry that with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I thought that was a, it was a really good telling moment for Sheridan at that, at that point. He's like, this is where, this is where this war between the Vorlons and the shadows has taken me, you know, yeah. and, and this is what I got to do. And you got to let me fight this war my way. And I'll get to that. Point yep. in a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Yeah. That's, that is a really heavy scene. And Brian Cranston for a really what's, con I, you know, it's like a very minor role. He, plays such an important part and really delivers. That was a huge score. We had no idea back then that he'd end up being Walter White on Breaking mm -hmm. Bad, among all the amazing things that he's done with his career since. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man, what a gem. What a mm -hmm. gem. So that's that's my first pick. Okay. Well, pick. shall we shall I follow that up with another really heavy one? Sure. Let's I mean, let's get heavy. Yeah, let's How get about, well, Oh, sorry, what? Well, it's just it's, a lot of Sheridan's career is heavy. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. You yeah. know. He, yeah, he he did some things. Yeah. <laughs> How about the whole freaking episode? Because I couldn't think of really any one moment I wanted to narrow it down to. The whole freaking episode of Intersections in real time. He right. and that interrogator, the way that Sheridan manages to uphold so, so well under those really dire circumstances. They're trying so hard to break him down and he refuses to let it go. It's quite, it's quite amazing. Mm -hmm. There's a, I read an article about this. Maybe it was a blogger. It was online. And essentially intersections in real time is a one room, two man play. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing is, is just all predicated on the strength of these two performers. You have Ray Burke, who's playing the interrogator and you have, you know, Bruce Boxleitner. Um, and I'm going to jump all the way. This is my top pick. This is, you is know, it? yeah. The, at, in intersections real time as, and, and one particular moment is my top pick always has been for, at least for John Sheridan. Okay. What is it? Um, and I think that this, this, we, we mentioned this before about how a lot of what JMS wrote 25 years ago was kind of like in play right now in real time. <laughs> More <laughs> relevant than ever, unfortunately. So it's when John Sheridan says, you know, <clears throat> Excuse me. Got to get my shirt and voice. Maybe you can fight the system. As long as just one person refuses to be broken, refuses to bow down. But can you win? Every time I say no. Yeah. Mm. I mean, if you really have to narrow it down to one point, maybe that is the apex. And those are good words to take with us as uh, things get pretty dire here in the States. Mm -hmm. And this is, for me, if you want to contrast this to um, Comes the Inquisitor, this is that moment. You know, this is where Delenn was being interrogated by, by Sebastian. Yes. Sheridan is being interrogated by this, you know, this particular Earth Force psychologist, psychiatrist, interrogator. But the conviction of his belief is what is getting him through. I, I never really struck Sheridan as being someone of any art particular faith, but the faith in democracy, the faith in being able to to defend the innocent. I mean, that's this is where it all oh. comes to boil, like at this moment. And, yeah. Right? And he stays so true and pure to what he believes in. He does not crack. He does not waver. Right. And it's yeah. you see him challenge authority not just to challenge authority but it's like look the reason why you can't crack me right now is because everything that i have been put uh either in responsibility of or has shaped me to this point 
you realize that this is how steel is forged. This is how unbreakable metal can get when you're forged in such in such trial and such heat. And I'm not going to break. <laughs> you know, I'm not even going to bend. You know, but uh, the the performance that, that that he gave in this episode is just it's one of the best I've ever seen. Like, yeah, ever. I mean, seriously, he should have won so many awards for this episode. There's um, it reminds me of this really famous uh, comic book uh, sequence for Captain America, where essentially Captain America is telling somebody, you know, um, when when everything, when society, when when religion, when politics are telling you to change and to you to be different, to you to, for you to move. Yeah, he says, plant yourself like a tree, and look back at them and say, "No, you move." Right? <laughs> I like. That's this moment for for me with John Sheridan. It really is. It is. Yeah, yeah John Bowersox has some really good comments about interrogation and the intensity of it where people are yelling at you and trying to break you down. The whole idea of being manipulated to make you say things that you don't actually believe to try and get you to crack and go against you know what you believe in. Uh, yeah, I mean, really, it's kind of a matter of time. Right. Mm -hmm. And they were drugging Sheridan. He might have been reaching that breaking point with, I mean, no matter how strong of a person you are, eventually at some point you can only survive so much sleep deprivation, so much food poisoning and all these things that they're doing to just torture the living crap out of you to get you to make that confession or whatever it is they want you to do. And yet the one thing he did have in his favor is the idea that they wanted him alive. Mm -hmm. They knew he was they were better off having him alive. And so that, that helped him hang on, I think, just long enough. Right. He was able to plan kind of like a specific defense because if they were going to kill him, then he- Then they just would have done it. They just would have done it. So at least he could hang on. And again, that the whole belief, the, 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 the core principle of who he is has always been someone who challenges authority. That's, that's always right. been his- you know, kind of like his personality trait, the, the, a, a very consistent personality trait throughout the series. Well, you know, I don't know if it's so much challenge authority, but fight for what you believe in. Yeah. Uh, but And if that means challenging authority, because that goes against your truth, that's what he does. Yeah. But there's a there's another scene where I think that it's not so much what he believes in, but he's challenging what has been the responsibility that has been thrust upon him. Oh, uh huh. Okay. Yeah. So in this scene, um, it was, where is it? Oh, interludes and examinations. This is season three. Okay. And this is yeah. where, uh, this is where he basically says, we got to bring the Vorlons into the fight or we're going to lose. And this is where he's, he basically kind of, throws down on on Kosh and Kosh. he says, you know, Okay, this is one of my moments that I have written down. Yeah, he says, unless your people get off their encounter suited butts and do something. Do something yeah. Disobedience. Yeah. Up yours. Up yours. I was waiting for you to get the, <laughs> the up yours moment. I, know I mean, it is on my list. Any good old John Sheridan saying up yours moment. It's right, right up there for me. Yeah. The only thing that was missing really from like a, a trifecta John Sheridan moment was him nuking something in that scene. <laughs> right. right? <laughs> 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 so yes, Kosh should be grateful that Sheridan did not nuke him. <laughs> but you know what I loved about this scene is that Sheridan, again, like intersections in real time, he is his back is up against the wall. He's got nothing yep. to lose. He's got everything to gain by risking everything. And he yeah. even said that, you know, look, um, my own government's trying to kill me. I can't win this war. If you kill me, uh, that just ends the cycle of pain as, as your car right. So, you know, it's just, I got nothing to lose. And you told me to fight this war. Well, you got to let me fight it my way. And you told me that I was, I was being trained by you to fight legends. Well, you're a legend too. I love that. You know, so. <laughs> oh yeah. It's so freaking good. Yeah. But he's absolutely freaking right. And one thing I love about John Sheridan is just when his back is up against the wall, that's when he's kind of the ballsiest, mm -hmm. you know? He really throws it out there. He takes that risk. He he does not play it safe. And I appreciate that. He has to, uh, he gets very inventive, you know, and he's very. He really does. Yeah. And this is where I think, um, uh, I guess at the time it would have been, was it General Leftcourt? He said that John Sheridan, I trained him and he's really good at adapting. That's what he does. Mm. 
You know, he, yes. he reads tactical situations really well and adapts to what needs to be done to overcome that tactical situation. Well, in this case, he's like, well, uh, let's see. When you're in a corner, all you can really do is go forward. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> it's just what direction of that corner in that, you know, 180 degrees from that corner can you go forward? Well, there's right. there's the shadows over here. There's the war lines over here. There's Earth Force over here. And there's uh, basically my death over here. So where do I want to go? <laughs> Prepare for ramming speed, if I may exactly. steal from another show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's like, today is a good day to die. Why not? Might as well. What have you got to lose? Nothing at all. Let's nuke it. But think about it up until this point, like the Vorlons have been so revered and kind of so uh, feared in a way because of uh, just people not knowing who they were or what they were capable of. And yeah. Sheridan just essentially just going, screw you, gods. I'm tired of your crap. Right. Well, and you know what? That was due. It was time for that. It was time for them to get involved. Like we've had this guidance from Kaj this whole time. And then he's just going to sit back and do nothing mm -hmm. besides that. Really? Uh, -uh. Yeah. Unacceptable. Nope. So that it, it kind of reminded me of what uh, Cisco was doing in, um, uh, in the pale moonlight where they had to bring in the Romulans to the war. Yeah, Albeit Garrick was a lot more involved with that, but it was just that yeah. moment where Sheridan had to like, like, um, like Cisco did. He had to sacrifice everything in order for this other dynamic to happen, and that's what Sheridan did. He had to basically sacrifice Kosh because once Kosh agreed, the the shadows went after him. Right, right. And the cool thing is Kosh knowing that price and does right. it anyway, but. I mean, Sheridan kind of put him in his corner. Mm -hmm. He put Kosh against the wall and Kosh, uh, bless his little heart. You know, he, <laughs> he did what he had to do. Yeah. Kosh is like, uh, yeah, you got me on this one. Sorry. Yeah. We've got a good comment that just came in from mm. TLB TLC. Uh, this is the point I think where Sheridan is starting to realize the relationship between Kosh and the shadows. Oh, Maybe yeah. so. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. And the interesting thing about the scene also uh, is you could see that there was the struggle between Kosh being the Vorlon. You know, he says, you know, disobedient. Right. Because everything about the Vorlons is order and obedience. And right. the shadows. Do are, as we say. Yeah, not as we do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Yep. And just then, like your parents, you know, you watch that or you see them, you know, and their vices and whatnot. Oh, don't do what I uh, am doing here. Just do what I say. But what I liked about what TLB said is that this is a point where uh, Sheridan is starting to realize the relationship between Kosh and the Shadows is that he realized that what Sheridan is actually becoming is becoming more of what the Shadows wanted than <laughs> what the Vorlons wanted mm. in this scene. Yeah. Right. Strength, yeah. strength through chaos. Sheridan yeah. has become chaotic in Kosh's eyes. Yes, because he's being disobedient. Mm -hmm. But he has to be. What right. choice does he have? So in that sense, if Kosh, since Kosh kind of agreed to sacrifice his life and to get the Vorlons into the into the fight, does that also mean in a certain way he kind of believed that the shadows are kind of right? Mm, now, isn't that interesting? Because if weren't, it, uh, Kosh could have just walked away. It's like, you know, nope, you're not following my rules. I'm going to find somebody who does. Maybe Ivanova, maybe Garibaldi. You know, they can, they mm. can listen to me, you know, and I can maybe. force them to. But all of a sudden, Kosh is like, oh, he's got a point, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I never really thought too much about that. You could be right. Yeah. Maybe he, yeah, maybe he sympathized just enough via Sheridan to realize, oh, this isn't working the way I thought it would. Well, you know, everything in Babylon 5 kind of alludes to the fact that since you spent so much time with off-worlders and people outside your own race, you start taking on the characteristics of all these other races, the, um, the quote unquote impurity of other races, i.e. like is, is Delenn any more not Minbari in, in, in physicality, but in belief because right. she's been around so many races, the same thing with Jakar, the same thing with Londo. They're all, they've, they've all kind of been, uh, I guess infected with each other's culture in a way. Mm, yeah, maybe, maybe. You know, so Kosh is like, yeah, maybe I have learned something or a thing or two from the humans. <laughs> Imagine that. We taught them a little something. Yeah. Another uh, good question in the comments. Why did Kosh open the door for Sheridan to go to the Shadows home world? Makes me wonder, did Kosh know about Lorien? 
That's a good question. I or, don't... I mean, did he, by Kosh sacrificing himself, did he sort of just say, was it kind of like a backdoor thing where, okay, Sheridan, you've sealed your fate. If you go to Zaha Doom, you will die. But the, the Vorlines never tell you the whole truth. It's so true. Right. So... So that maybe he knew something was going to happen because that's, you know, he said, you know, that it's, it's, it's both easy and difficult to believe that Kosh or the Varlons had that much forethought. Yeah. Because they're shrouded in such mystery. And that's of course a really good, as a writer and and Straczynski being one of the best ever, those are those trap doors that you allow yourself so that you're like, okay, I need a way out here, so I can just shroud this thing in mystery and kind of uh, and um, and uh, interpretation. Right. And what's great is JMS uses that judiciously. Mm-hmm. It's not a Deus Ex Machina at all. I don't think. Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, another new moment, if mm-hmm. if we could. Sure. Uh, one of my favorite kind of lines from Sheridan is at the end of the Shadow War. He tells the Vorlons in the shadows where to stick it. He says, get the hell out of our galaxy, both of you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm. that's that's a very, very signature Sheridan moment, totally. It really is. It's angry Sheridan. Yeah, but it's kind of like we've, we've claimed this time, this third age of mankind as our own. This is yep. what you wanted. You wanted us to grow from chaos. We did. You wanted us to follow your orders to get to this point. We did. So. And now what? Yeah. And we're tired of kind of like being the children, seeing our parents slap each other across the table. You know, it's time for us to stand up on our own. You taught us that, (laughs) you know, at one point in time, there's going to be chaos. It's going to allow the younger races to grow. At the other time, you still have to follow rules and regulations in order for us to all come together. We know how to balance these two Dot, you know, opposing forces out. Right. You've both done your job. And it's like when a child turns 18, okay. It's time for me to figure it out for myself now. You've mm-hmm. done your job. You've parented me. It's time for me to go off. And I'm going to make mistakes, and that's the way it's going to be, but you got to learn. You the funny stand thing on your was is that um, Lorian, when he was watching this happen, he was almost kind of like the grandparents. Like, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. I don't agree with any of this, that's but <laughs> I'm just kind of watching it. I'll You're step right. in if I have to. Yeah, yeah, for real though, it's kind of great. Yeah, no words. D- there don't need to be any. Yeah, and I he, loved. Uh, I think it was Ed Wasser who voiced the shadow in that situation, that shadow hologram or vision. Oh, was because, it? Yeah, because he's like, "Will you come with us?" Yes. You know, I'm like, it's like oh. kind of like scared little kids almost. They don't know what to do if they aren't manipulating the younger races, and I thought that was right. It was interesting that they gave that shadow, that voice, and that tone because it it humanized the shadow side for a while. I think it humanized both of them, honestly, you know? where even though they're older as a race and more advanced technologically than we are, they're, they're really just scared little animals like the rest of us. Yeah. And up until that point, all you really heard from the shadows was kind of like that digital chirping, you know. The squeal coming yeah. to life. So it, now you see like, okay, they're, they also, there's an intelligence there. There's ascensions there, obviously. They're not just, it's kind of like when you see a spider, you know, the spider could be the most noble creature, but when you see it, it's just eight legs, scary looking, you got to step on it. That's kind of like <laughs> the, you know, that's where they went with the shadows, but it doesn't necessarily make that evil. It just sure. makes it, you know, uncomfortable because of what we've been trained by the Vorlons to understand. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, really, up until the episode Zaha Doom, we're kind of led to believe that the Vorlons are on our side and they're the good ones. Mm -hmm. And then John goes to Zaha Doom, gets their side of the story, and they've got a point too, like it or not. You may not agree with it, but you can, you know, from their point of view, you can see what they're trying to do. I'm I'm wondering if anyone has ever put kind of the uh, extrapolated from all the way back when when say like Dr. Kyle like looked into the Vorlon suit and saw Kosh because it's the only time that they've ever like the humans have ever cracked a Vorlon suit like, uh-huh. ever. If in some way that affected Kosh and really got to see like what humanity was all about through Dr. Kyle's hmm. um, his, uh, I guess his, his sympathy or his, uh, his care as a doctor. It's entirely possible. Because and maybe, yeah, maybe that's why Kosh kind of does hang around a little bit on Babylon 5. 
Because if it weren't for that, then everyone would be like Darth Kosh, right? <laughs> right. Like the other Yeah, Vorlon. you know, I always did feel like Kosh had a little bit of a soft spot, if not for humans, at least for Sheridan. But maybe yeah. humans, generally speaking, more than other Vorlons. Yeah, that's something that uh, I'd love for the listeners to chime in on, either here yes, or on the Facebook please. page. But that's that's just something that, why did Kosh yeah, why evolve did he care? the way he did? You know, because it's not, doing? it's not like they're evolving like just immediately. I mean, the, the Vorlons have been around since ever, right? So Right. And they were sudden, hanging out with Mimbari, too. Yeah. So, so. there's that whole thing. Uh, you know, we could talk yeah. about that for the full hour. But how about another moment from you? Okay. So... <laughs> again kind of like in the in in the politics of today yes something that i just find so unbelievably poignant and timely is end game cuz mm, uh-huh the I think end i know your moment when basically john sheridan says you know we have assembled this coalition of forces to liberate earth from a uh, tyrannical government Right. And your sons, your daughters. Yeah, exactly. And it's uh, on my list. <laughs> we have come home. We have we're here to place President Clark under, under arrest. arrest. Yes. You know, and and to liberate. Oh, it's Earth. so good. Speech Sheridan is just primo. You have Speech right. Sheridan, you have season four hair Sheridan, and you have goatee Sheridan. That's like a trifecta Sheridan, right? <laughs> <laughs> that needs to be an infographic. Trifecta, yeah. It's like um okay, hair season three, not so much there, but good speeches. You know, <laughs> later on in season three, um, better speeches. Season four, not quite the goatee yet, but better hair, great speeches. And then after interlude, real time goatee Sheridan and great hair and, and amazing speeches, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he was just becoming more presidential. He was preparing to become the leader of the Interstellar Alliance. That's all. Have you realized like how much facial hair kind of like uh, evolved over the course of, of P5? <laughs> you know, you had Sheridan getting facial hair. You had Garibaldi getting facial hair. <laughs> and know? losing what's on and top of his head. Hair. Yeah. Hmm. You know, I hadn't thought too much about that. So uh, that's that scene, though, in and of itself. You know, we want to kick out Nightwatch. We want to kick out, you know, the uh, the oppressive um, uh, governments. Uh, and and he's willing to put everything on the line, you know, uh, because because yeah. because freedom and democracy and returning the government to the people is worth everything. It's worth assembly. It's like everything that I've done has has led me to this moment, and I'm it I'm is. waiting. I'm waiting in today's day and age for our John Sheridan. Oh, me too. And I, I right now I feel like we don't have one. Yeah. Well, we're still well, waiting for whoever that is going to be to come out of the woodwork. And any time now, any time. <laughs> Where is our hero? Who who could this be? Yeah. But I, I think that it's just again really interesting to overlay that which happened you know two and a half decades ago with the situation that's happening now um yeah. well, it I, just I just goes to show history repeats itself oh totally and sooner than you think uh, yeah oh i never ever thought in our lifetimes we would be going through this crap so yeah. soon after world war ii in the grand scheme of things world war ii was not that long ago we shouldn't be dealing with this again but we're fallible little human beings and boy do we know how to forget yeah yep so that's I think we've, what have, have we agreed on, we, so we agreed on intersections in real time. Yes. And game. Uh-huh. And interludes and examinations. Yes. Right? Yep, uh, yep, yep. I think now, those are kind of like a really good watermark moments, though. Yeah, I mean, those are definitely, I think, those make all the lists, right? <laughs> the majority yeah. of people's lists. Are there any rare ones that you have? I do. And I think that, I don't know, maybe, I'm not sure if it's rare. It, it, you and I might not have it on our list together, but I really loved when Sheridan went after Boggs in Ceremonies of Light and Dark. Oh, yeah. Oh, my. Because that is just when Sheridan just lost his mind. He did. He did lose his you-know-what. Right. I'm going after him. He's mine. Yeah, he's mine. You know, and that's that's when... Sheridan's like, you know, mm -mm. exactly. You're, you're taking a woman that I've fallen in love with, but I haven't admitted it yet because I will. Right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> you represent everything that I've been trying to fight against because, you know, you're your home guard, night watch, you're, uh, you're gross. Yeah. And, and you're also anti Minbari. You're a xenophobe. You're everything that I stand against. Right. And I, and I, and he goes, you know what? I haven't been able to throw a haymaker punch at any of the politics that I've been fighting, but I can throw it at you. 
And the punches, <laughs> You're I mean, get it. he threw from the hip. Oh, it was punches. intense. Yeah. And it was, there was so much anger behind those punches. Oh yeah. Right? I mean, and, he let it rip and it yeah. was great. No more home guard. No more night yeah. watch. No more. Like, no man. more. I love the way he says that too. And then no more of you at the very end, he kind of catches his breath and he just goes no more. Like, and that's, that's almost, um, <sighs> that's the moment where he plants his flag and like, you know what? I'm taking the fight out. Yeah. Right. Oh, so good. So good. Yeah. And then he has that really tender moment with Delenn and it's just, it's like, you just kind of see it all kind of coming together at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I, I cannot wait to watch that episode with Patrick because it's coming up in our watch. Let everyone know. Where is it coming up? Let everyone know. <laughs> um, well, it's on Babel for Five, which is a part of uh, the Nerd Party. It's the one and only vidcast on the network right now. And my husband is watching Babel on Five for the very first time. And so what we do is we watch an episode of Babel on Five. We record uh, his reaction. I tend to kind of you know ask some questions. What are his thoughts on it? We discuss what happens in the episode. Um, condense the footage down to five minutes for a Babel for Five. And then that's the show. So you guys should watch that. And I'm, I'm glad that you're going to come up um, on that episode soon because it's so good. And Oh, yeah. You know, the, uh, the, the actors in that episode, the actors who play Bog and, and the other uh, kind of like the other ex-mercenary or yeah. mercenary soldier racist xenophobe, they're, they're, both, they're both great. So They are. They, they're just a-holes of the highest order. Yeah. They do a great job of it. <laughs> so that was kind of like one of my you know, not major, major, major speechy moments, but it, I thought that it was very impactful for a, a Sheridan moment. Very much. Good pick. I did not have that on my list, but it should have been there. So what's, what about you? What's next on your list? Uh, the next one on my list is uh, uh, Sheridan's plan to rally the League of Non-Aligned Worlds in Rumors, <laughs> Bargains, and Lies. I'm specifically thinking of the scene where they're all eating breakfast uh -huh. and he's, He's just kind of laughing to himself as he's coming up with this little scheme mm -hmm. and, you know, scares the bejesus out of Ivanova. And we all know how well she does mornings. And yeah. <laughs> just, I love that scene. It cracks me up. It's so great. That he's like, I got it. Whoa. Oh, God. Okay. What? what? What's going on? And he just, we don't know what is happening until he actually can execute the plan. And it's so good. And then he has that moment in the, the, the lift. Yes. Because it worked. <laughs> That's a great moment. It's, oh. it's funny too, but it's it's also it was nice that that Bruce was able to kind of like cut loose a little bit with a little bit more humor. Yeah, it was nice to interject that when there is so much serious stuff going on. Yeah, yeah, that was funny though. It was so damn good. And I think that uh, wasn't wasn't it Jeff as Zach? You know, he's just kind of like looking over there and he's like, "Yes, he really wrong with the is." Yeah, I mean, he's not really acting that much in that scene. It's it's Jeff Conaway just taking it in, like, oh god, this is great. <laughs> oh, I, I remember, like, look if you look really close, they're like either on the point or have like broke character, like in that scene. They start. Oh my gosh! I mean, how could you keep it in? It's so good. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah, like Jeff Conaway definitely breaks, and I'm not sure about Richard Biggs. I've not really studied him in depth, but he might have kind of broken a little bit too. Uh, TLB says, sorry, I'll miss the rest of this, but I've got to go. Are you recording this? Yes. Yes. yes Thank you for are. joining us. Uh, you'll always be able to find this back on the, uh, on the YouTube after we're done, it'll be hosted there on our YouTube page. So make sure you subscribe and uh, hit the bell for your updates. Yes. Okay. And you can also, if you are on the Facebook group, you can click the link to access the video. If that's easier for you either way. Yes. You can watch it after the fact we're here for and posterity. Then, yeah. Where all of our, all of our videos are hosted here. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So, yeah, don't worry about that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, uh, John Bower Sox makes a good point that we touched on just a moment ago. You, you need humor in tense times. You really do, because if you're not laughing just a little bit, you're just going to cry, you know? And seasons three and four were so heavy. They were so, so intense. So heavy. Yeah. So much going on. Yeah. So it is good to have a little bit of levity. That's why I love Sick Transit, tr Sick Transit Veer. Because it's a lighthearted episode in the midst of all the chaos that's going on. And it's not like it's this offbeat standalone. No, it's integrated with everything mm -hmm. else. But after all that has happened, it's nice to just kind of breathe and have something that you can laugh with for a little bit. Is that the episode with uh, Linda Stee? Yes. Whoa. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And her demented ass. Uh -huh. Freaking 
mental bag of snakes, that one. Speaking of like mental disorders and whatnot. Oh my she, God. No, she is like, but is it though? Like, well, I mean, no, I really think that's just her. I don't think it's actually a mental disorder. It's just that's, she really does believe that Narns are less than. Makes Antari Prime great again. Oh, she's wearing that red hat. Let me tell you. Right. <laughs> anyway, I have. One, I gotta go barf now. I have a, a one last fun. I have a fun Sheridan pick, and I'm surprised that you haven't brought it up. I thought you would have brought it up by now. Do it, Sergeant Slaughter. <laughs> it's on my list. I knew it. I knew it'd be on your list. I love it when Sheridan tells stories, and this is one of my favorites. Sergeant Slaughter. Yeah, I, and I knew I was going to come back because I got to come back and do whatever I had to do. And yeah, I, I got socks, had socks to wash. To wash. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. That's on my list, as well as when he's talking to Delenn about why he loves the sound of rain hitting the roof. Oh, in yeah. That's a great scene. See what I mean? Like those. Oh. I know. Mm. And she mm. made it rain for him. I know. Right? And then they held hands and it was so beautiful. Those really early relationship or moments. I mean, it's just, ah. Right? Yeah. Like you kind of, you know, ever so briefly, like how this is going to progress. They are going to get these two together. But God, it takes forever. That first time you're watching is like, just kiss already. <laughs> and and you know what? I'm I'm glad that 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 Straczynski didn't like hold that over us. Didn't lord that over us. Like they actually made that relationship a real. Dynamic. Right. Yeah. Cause they did the angst a little bit with um, Ivanova and Marcus, but mm -hmm. they weren't going to play that game with Sheridan and Delenn. And I was really grateful for that too. Right. John Bowersock says Sergeant Slaughter was a wrestler back in the day. You're absolutely right. Sergeant <laughs> Slaughter, Sergeant Slaughter was a wrestler of the WWF when the WWF was still that entity, the World Wrestling Federation. He was yeah. created because there were two really popular wrestlers at the time. One is named the Iron Sheik, who very much looked like an Iranian. This is the early 80s, remember? Right, and right, then right. And you had the other, another guy named Nikolai Volkov, who was this Russian. So you had hmm. a Russian and you had um, an Iranian at like the pinnacle of villains in the WWF. And all of a sudden comes golden boy, Hulk Hogan and Sergeant Slaughter who wore a drill hat and all that kind of stuff. And then he became kind of a, uh, an additional character slash action figure for GI Joe. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So good. He was their drill sergeant, drill sergeant, Sergeant Slaughter. Yeah. <laughs> so when I, when I heard that, when I heard him bring that up, I'm like, it kind of made me bristle a little bit, but I understand where they were going with that because it's like Sergeant mm -hmm. Slaughter. He, the wrestler Sergeant Slaughter isn't the only drill sergeant that's been named Sergeant Slaughter. I'm sure, sure they're sure. all over the place. They're Sergeant Slaughters. I have to imagine. Yeah. And then in the future, there's that many more, right? Yeah. Going forward. But this is the only one that taught Sheridan how to wash his socks. It's super important. Right. Because I got socks to wash. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So, okay, I'm going through my list right now, just mm. kind of mentally checking off the ones that we have covered. I have one more that yeah. we have not discussed. It is one of my absolute favorites. Okay. It's the recording he makes for his unborn child and objects at rest. Mm -hmm. It's, I don't know, it's soothing and beautiful and it's so satisfying leading into sleeping at light. And it's just like, oh, it, it's, I don't know. It's kind of refreshing. Just after all that they've been through, he can have this beautiful moment, even though it's sort of dampered with the fact that, no, he isn't going to be around to see his child at this age when his child watches it. But I don't know. There's just something like really fitting and beautiful about it. You know, his love for Delenn and the way he says to Delenn, have I t told you today how much I love you? And she said, yes, but uh, you can repeat it as much as you like. I mean, it's just, I don't know. It's touching. It moves me. And it's also something that's very human because I know that fathers and mothers, uh, especially in today's day and age, they record these moments, you know, for posterity. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it's a lot easier to do when you can speak into like a cell phone, you know, or record something on a video online and, and save it for posterity. It was before it's like you had to set up the video camera and all that kind of stuff or, or, <laughs> right. or, or use a personal tape recorder. But now, you know, uh, it would have been really nice if they continued the David Sheridan storyline to have, to have him have that, you know, right. and, and yeah. um, 
play it, even if it was just an audio file, just to play it to kind of like when things went went poorly, he always had this data crystal of his father's voice yeah. to go back to. I want to see this moment where he watches or listens to this recording for the first time. I always feel like David Sheridan is like one of the biggest missing pieces in Babylon 5. And if Babylon 5 ever does come back, I want David Sheridan to take center stage. Yeah. I it, want it to I, be his story. It would be a natural evolution, obviously, of the story, since we don't want to go back to that time period. And it will be the time um, where John's gone because it'll be 20 years past. Right. And and David Sheridan would be in, I don't know, wherever his station is. If Even if he is in the military at all, he might not be. You know, he might be a diplomat. But he he might was be an a ambassador. ranger. Right. But I mean, he might be a diplomat or he might have just gone into a different phase. Sure. You sure. Know? Yeah, so, like what how did where did he end up? What is he doing? How is he right. doing it? He may have followed his grandfather's footsteps because, you know, he might um, have. He had he was an ambassador or diplomat. A diplomat, yeah. 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 So, you never know. Or he might have just stayed in Minbar. You know, and Who knows? took over the I mean, ISA. Right. We don't get to know. So, yeah. I would love it if at some point if there's ever a way for Babylon 5 to come back, let's fill in that gap. Let's Get rid of some of those missing pieces. You know, one big moment that we haven't talked about, and it didn't make either of our lists, so I'm curious as to why, was the speech uh, when Sheridan came back to Babylon 5 after he left Zahadum. Oh, you know what that is on my list? I just haven't okay. mentioned it yet. Well, there you go. Yeah, rallying everybody. <laughs> Are you with me? Can I count on you? Another speechy Sheridan moment. Right. And that there's... I love it how they refer back to that in Sleeping in Light, where he's standing I was, there. Yeah, I was just about to mention that. Right. I love it so much, that echo. Will you stand with me? That's <laughs> yes. Oh, it's so good. I mean, it's it's that rallying cry. He had that ability to unite people. And they needed someone to believe in. They needed somebody to come back from something that was uh, from a from a place where nobody returned. You know, nobody comes right. back from Zahadum. Yeah, and I mean, yeah. I, I kind of there was that melancholy after Sheridan was considered dead. Mm -hmm. What do we do now? You know, everybody was lost. Right, they were going through all the motions, Ivanova especially. Well, right. You know, definitely was, her. Yeah, she had her very many hours of the wolf <laughs> with a lot of vodka, uh -huh, mm -hmm. as you do, and the three little shots for all the puppies. <laughs> yes, you know, little sips <laughs> of vodka, but. Uh -huh. That's what. That's where you really got to see how much of a leader that Sheridan was. How much. How much he took it upon himself, and that also leads me to that. It's not so much a Sheridan moment, but it's a great moment in, um, uh, in the Rock Cried Out No Hiding Place, where that that reference says, "Hey, you know what? You know when you know when Adam was lonely, God created Eve, and you know I don't want to. I don't want to burden." you know, my problems with Delenn. And he's like, I didn't tell you to burden her with it. I just said, share your your problems with your partner. And that's right. where things started to foster a little bit stronger between like Delenn and Sheridan, you know, towards the end of season three. But one of the things was um, what I thought was also really a great moment. And it wasn't even him so much on screen. It was like intercut at the end of Zaha Doom with all the different scenes is when his data crystal recording to Delenn, you know, uh... and then she just kind of like reaches the cross and Mm -hmm. And like, then slowly hunkers down, yeah, crying. <laughs> I was crying along with her the first time I watched that. Like, no freaking way is this happening right now. No. Like, just when we got to this point in our relationship, I got to right? go. <laughs> yeah, well, and then there's all that conflict, too, during that episode where Sheridan is essentially saying, you and Kosh lied to me about Anna. Mm -hmm. And how could you? You know, I was starting to think about us and building a life and then you know then this happens and yeah. what, what am i supposed to do with this and then and then he comes back with that message and just like oh, oh no. <laughs> i'm not ugly crying you're ugly crying right mm. then and, and and that leads me to my last favorite moment um was in sleeping in light where it's not it's not the scene when they were in the hallway it's just the scene when he puts on his on la shock uniform again and stares into the mirror ah uh, and yeah. as and you're just like what a journey. Like, you know, what what um what has shaped this man in front of him? And the look that he gives himself, he's just like, geez. <laughs> <laughs> you know? You've been through some things, Johnny. Yeah, you've been yeah, and he's like, Yeah, I think it's shrunk in storage. 
Yes, of course it did. Yeah, yes. That it wasn't those it. donuts. Like, no. Ah, so good. Oh my so, gosh. Uh, yes. Tears. tears. I, I know. But yeah, that moment really, it, yeah, it's nonverbal, but it really does all kind of come full circle there. Yeah. And I think maybe it's because, because the, the makeup was so good and because uh, they created this moment for him to like, this is, this is the last time he's going to set foot on Minbar, at least physically, yes. you know, he just looks at that mirror. And I think that Bruce is just like, wow, what a career, what, you know, what a span, right. what of, a journey of this career of, of my, um, of my professional life, you know, and, and where I've been able to bring this character. Yeah. And, oh, I mean, yeah. yeah. Incredible. That's, that's one of the beautiful things about Babylon five is every one of those characters, you, you can see that journey in a lot of them. I, I would say the same for Ivanova when she puts on the, on the shock robe, mm -hmm. it's like new chapter for her. And suddenly like, uh, finally she, she kind of feels like she has a purpose again. Yeah. After kind of languishing around as a general, not really happy with her life. No, she was a politician. She was a, a military politician on parade. She was a figurehead. Right. And that's right? not Ivanova at all. Nope. Not not when you're like contrasting that with what she was responsible for on the station and CNC, going out there on a Star Fury, leading a squad. Right. right. Yeah, she no. Probably the worst possible career move she could have made. And yet, you know, I'd really love to know that story. How did she end up there? What really... What did they do to her? <laughs> or, I mean, was she just going through the motion so much that when I think they that, decided to promote her and give her a desk, she just said, all right. I think Marcus's death broke her. Oh, of course it did. You I know. mean, that's when she lost her way. But, yeah. you know, for a while, we know that she took command of a ship and she went into deep space. Yeah. But then after that, I mean, yeah, she really lost her way, the poor lady. Yeah. So that was what happened in those 20 years. I mean, you know, you're, you're right. She was promoted. She had her own ship, but I think it's just because she needed to get so far away from what happened. Right. She you know, knew she wasn't going to, she couldn't stay on Babylon five, even right. though that was the original plan, but that aside. Right. And, uh, I don't know if there's a book that covered that. So we can probably take a look. Maybe that's our homework for next show. Mm, see if there's something in the novel verse. That's, that's a good research project idea. Yeah. The twenty-year span of Ivanova's career. Yeah, I mean, have you read death. um, have you read the short story about what happens with Marcus in Ivanova? Okay, well, so you know we'll about start that. There. Maybe we'll start there. Okay, yeah, yeah, if you've not read that, I forget what it's called. Do you know what it is offhand? I have the printout. I have a printout. Yeah, uh, you can find story. it online. It's a short story written by JMS that discusses the future of uh, Marcus Cole and Susan Ivanova. What happens? And it's well worth a read. Yeah. So what do you think? You want to tackle that? Do you, do you think a week's worth uh, enough time? Or do you want to tackle that later on? Um, well, next week, I'm not going to be able to be here for the show because I'm going to go be visiting family out oh, of town. Own. I won't have online access. I'll have, you know, crappy hotel Wi-Fi. It's not going to go down. No worries. No <laughs> so, worries. Um, you know, uh, I don't even know how much we've talked about this. So let's just do it here live. I mean, if you want to do a show with a guest or on your own or what have you, you're welcome to it. Otherwise, we'll probably have to take a week off and then pick up from there. I can probably what I'd like to do is because we're getting so much great uh, chatter now in the in the live chat that I might just do what I wanted to do before and do kind of like a and ask me anything. Oh, OK, cool. Yeah. yeah, go for it. Oh, uh, Daniel Keller has a great comment asking, mm. where do you guys recommend buying the novels? eBay. eBay. We're and not going to find them at Barnes and Noble. Yeah, they're all out of print, and you know, look for the cheap ones. I mean, people have read them. Time. I mean, these are these are novels that came out in like the late nineties. Right. Yeah, they're 2000s. twenty something years old. It's really hard to find them in really superior mint condition. So my advice would be to find a lot where yeah. you find where where you, it's like a several of the books, or at least get like the trilogies complete. Mm -hmm. um, and you can usually score a pretty decent price. So just just watch a little bit, and you'll know when to strike. And I know that uh, Terry Jones ha watches the show, not in real time because it's uh, it just doesn't work for his time schedule. But he's across uh, the pond. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe Terry, um, this is a note for you uh, mm -hmm. to maybe help us out here, and maybe in the show notes or on the Facebook page, you can let us know like where you might think some good sources are aside from eBay. 
online. Right. If there are any, I would be curious to know that too, because you and I have both done the eBay thing. And I know yeah. Terry watches eBay too. Yeah. Um, he's specifically been looking out for advanced copies of JMS's autobiography, which is officially being released on Monday now. So I'm right, super because... stoked about that. Oh, and also, I think Terry, he linked this in the Facebook page, but uh, JMS is signing cover book plates. Yes, he is. Yeah, so book. check that out. Yeah, and if you're not familiar with what a book plate is, they used to do this back in the day where you would get basically a, a carbon copy of the cover and you can either use it as a sticker and put it on top of the actual cover or you can just keep it as a separate piece and just stick it in the kind of like the, the inside cover of your book. But it's uh, he's signing it both generically and uh, he's uh, also signing it personally. Yes. Yeah, it's pretty cool that he's doing this. Yeah, because he says that his convention circuit isn't as extensive for this book. Um, I guess this book uh, marketing junket, but yeah. he wants to make sure that his fans get signatures. Yeah. Well, if I'm remembering correctly, um, like he's not going overseas for a book tour specifically, at least not yet at this moment. And so yeah. people, especially if they're not in the U.S. and they can't make it to a convention, this is a way to get the book personalized and yeah, autographed. Definitely. It's good stuff. So we are about up on our time, Shar. So we are. An did, hour has passed. <laughs> did you did you dig? Did you dig the 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 list that we came up with? Yeah, the, the I moments? think we hit on a lot of good moments, and it, it was certainly not comprehensive by any means. So I want all of our viewers to chime in with their moments that we have not discussed here, or if they uh, liked the, what we said, um, give us your take on that. Why do you love that moment so much? I have like all of my notes outlined with the um, clips from YouTube. And I'm going to post that on the Facebook page so people cool. can kind of see like where I was coming from with that. Um, you probably have something like similar uh, on your notes. But yes, um, next week, uh, Shar, while, while you're gone, I'll just run a live question and answer, ask me anything session. And nice. I'm going to try and uh, dance on the coals as best I can. Oh, I think you will do swimmingly. And John Bauer socks is into the idea. And so you know, with that, you're golden. Oh yeah. I mean, John and I can, we can fill up an hour easily. <laughs> Just the two of you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it could, it could range, it can, and it can arrange the, it can arrange the gamut, you know, uh, maybe it's not all just about ba Babylon five. Hmm. Maybe as, as yeah. ask me anything, anything. anything. Yeah. So guys get ready to ask Norm some really intensely personal questions and Amer and make him blush. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do it, do it for I'll me. You, do it for I'll, me. I'll give you uh, a Vorlon's version of the truth. <laughs> are there going to be little voices in the background when you give your mysterious non-answer i am the hand char <laughs> you are the hand what is that supposed to mean i'm the hand i'll have like a dove like float by i'll dress all in black with like a white bird on my shoulder something like that do i know who you yeah. are i am the hand <laughs> okay it's time to close up shop here yeah. So anyway, oh my God. Um, make sure everyone, if you like what you saw here on YouTube to share out the Zocalo cast, you can share, like, subscribe, make sure you hit that bell icon and uh, that will notify you when our new shows are up. We do this every Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific yep, Standard Time, time 1 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. And we're also on Facebook and on Twitter and on Instagram. So make sure that you follow all of our contact information down there in the liner notes. And we will yeah. see you next Sunday uh, for a live question and answer session. And until that time, be seeing you. Bye.